I'm really thrilled to be here. And um, Father Sean and I were talking some months ago when he invited me to come because he knows that in my vicinity of the world is the other university for the Sacred Heart Province, St. Francis. And I've been there several times. And last fall, I gave um, a lecture there. And my friend Father Sean did not want to be slighted. So <laughs> I'm proud and uh, happy to have received the invitation to be with you this evening. Just as a way of introduction, why did I choose this topic about Pope Francis and Catholic social teaching, principles, spirituality, and action? Well, there's not any special reason except, like a lot of people in our world today, he has certainly captured my attention. And as a kind of remembrance of him capturing my attention, I got the awesome experience of having met him personally last summer during a diocesan pilgrimage and we met outside of the papal summer residence in Castle Gandolfo in Italy. And Father Sean has some prayer cards, and um, especially you young people are welcome to have one. It has a photograph of me and Pope Francis having a little chat in front of his house. I'd like to start with an introduction, and I would title this introduction as What I Learned About Catholic Social Teaching, Principles, Spirituality, and Action from a group of high school students. Now you have to follow me because I know this sounds a little bit convoluted, but maybe it'll make sense. In the fall of 2012, I was invited by the Justice and Peace Commission of the Diocese of Altoona Johnstown to give a seminar on Catholic social teaching, and that meeting took place on the campus of St. Francis University in Loretto. Most of the participants in that seminar are uh, involved in parish ministries in the Diocese of Altoona Johnstown. And I've not yet mastered the art of using PowerPoint. I noticed the screen is up here just in case. But when I gave that seminar, I had a handout with, um, it was actually multi-pages, with an outline and um, even some bibliography in case anyone wanted to do additional reading. I lectured for about an hour, we had a coffee break, and then the second section was only about a 30-minute lecture with the rest of the time available for questions until lunch. At the question time, there was a man who was sitting way in the back of the room who raised his hand and he said I ha he had a question. But he started off by thanking me for my lecture and he said it was the first time that he had heard anyone explain the Catholic social teaching, the basic principles of Catholic social teaching in language that he could understand. Now naturally, I was feeling pretty good about his compliment and before I could enjoy the moment, then he interrupted my thought and said, but I do have a question. And it was an excellent question. He asked me, how would you go about teaching young people, and he meant high school students, because he was a, a teacher in the parish religious education program. He taught juniors in high school. He said, how would you go about teaching young people about Catholic social teaching? Now, I looked around that room that Saturday morning, and I realized that there were only four people in the room who were younger than me. Okay, I'm almost 60 now, okay, so you can imagine. There weren't too many young people who were there. And, um, I said to the group, I'd like to do a little experiment. I need your help, and I'm going to ask you a question. So I said, those of you who know what I'm going to ask, you just jump in and respond as you feel is appropriate, and we'll see where it goes. So I asked the group the question, who made me? Now, it took a, just a couple of seconds when all of a sudden, all together, they responded, God made me. And then, of course, I had to follow it up with the next question, why did God make me? I know there's some people here who's got it down, right? God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. And, right, I heard Baltimore Catechism mentioned because I'm old enough to have been taught the Baltimore Catechism in Catholic elementary school. And anyone of my generation or older would remember memorizing those lessons in that format. But it was more than just memorizing responses that was occurring during that use of the Baltimore Catechism when I was a child. 
You see, it gave us the vocabulary, the formulas, and a framework for having a conversation about the Catholic faith. And what was so good about it at that time was because we all spoke the same language by using that text and that methodology. Now all the adults in the group, and I said there was only three or four that were younger than me, they all nodded their head in agreement with my observations. But then one woman asked, but how does that question get to what you're supposed to do to teach high school students? And this is how I responded to that question, how do you teach Catholic social teaching, principles of Catholic social teaching to high school students? In the spring of 2012, I was with a group of 40 high school students who were representatives of the four Catholic high schools in the Diocese of Altoona Johnstown. It's an annual event where the bishop gets together with representatives of those schools. The morning started off with the usual kind of icebreakers, and we had morning prayer together. And um, we had an open forum then, which was um, advertised as the main part of the, the experience. And the open forum was that these high school students could ask me anything about the Catholic faith. Only one rule applied, though. It had to be a serious question. It wasn't just to ask trick questions or, or just make fun of things. It was actually serious. And they did have great questions. They knew they could ask those kind of questions. And so the first questions everywhere I go, especially with adolescents, do you know what the first question that people ask? Bishop Mark, would you tell us the story about your vocation, not as a bishop, but as a priest? I was ordained a priest in 1981, and I, I couldn't have asked for a better life to serve God in the church. Anyways, um, after a couple of questions about my vocation, there was a young man, I think he was a junior in high school. We were sitting in a large circle, so you can imagine 40 high school students and me, just in one big circle, and this high school junior asked me the question, Bishop Mark, did you see the Coney YouTube video? Did you see the Coney YouTube video? And I looked at him and I actually said, what? <laughs> and he said, the video about Joseph Coney, it's been seen all over the country by at least half the people our age. Now I had to admit to this group of teenagers that I seldom look at videos on YouTube and then I had to ask, the further question, who is Joseph Coney? And as soon as I said that, the group of young people who I was with that day erupted, erupted with descriptions of a man who was leader of an armed militia in Central Africa, who was known for some brutal crimes against humanity, although Joseph Coney would like to refer to himself as a revolutionary and not a criminal or a terrorist. So I asked, what was this big interest that they all of a sudden were demonstrating about this person, Joseph Coney? In the most passionate way, one of the girls in the group, I think she was a senior in high school, she began telling me that she learned that Joseph Coney and his gang were responsible for kidnapping, enslaving, brainwashing and sexually assaulting children and teenagers, and then disposing of them when they were finished. So for the next 20 minutes, without a pause, for the next 20 minutes, those high school students were absorbed in a conversation in which we explored all kinds of basic principles that have to do with Catholic social teaching. And it took absolutely no prompting from me to get that conversation going or to sustain it. They wanted to tell me all about what was going on with Joseph Coney and his militia, which he, by the way, happens to refer to as the Lord's Resistance Army. And so in our conversation, but not in an explicit way, we talked about things like the God-given dignity of every human person. We talked about the truth that we are all made in the image and likeness of God. We talked about the sacredness of all human life from conception to natural death. We talked about the rights of individual persons and we talked about the common good of persons. The goodness of human sexuality was discussed 
as it is to be expressed in the most blessed and beautiful way in the covenant of marriage, as opposed to the sexual exploitation and rape of young persons, which can never be found to be acceptable. And we talked in that group for those 20 minutes about things like truth and justice and mercy and love and hope and faith in the one true God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and who can never be substituted by a cult figure like Joseph Coney, who claims to be an agent of God. When the group of high school students had finished speaking about all of those things, I asked the girl who was sitting right next to me, and we were all in that big circle still, I asked her to read something from one of my favorite um, books, The UCAT. Never leave home without it, especially when I'm with young people. And I asked her to read something, and this is what she read. The joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the men of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted in any way, are the joy and the hope, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well. That's a quote from the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, number one. And then she went on to read from the UCAT. In her social teaching, the church makes this statement specific. And she asks, how can we take responsibility for the well-being and the just treatment of all, even of non-Christians? What is a just organization of human society, of political, economic, and social institutions? What are they supposed to look like? In her commitment to justice, the church is guided by a love that emulates Christ's love for all mankind. That's in number 438 of the UCAT. When that girl finished reading that text from the catechism, there was a boy sitting off to the side over here. He kind of folded his arms and sat back and said, now that's what I'm talking about. I asked the group of high school students at that point, where are we going with this? Where are we going with this conversation? Remember, I didn't start it. It was an open forum. They could ask me any questions. And that's where it went for 20, more than 20 minutes. So I said, where are we going with this? And they explained the campaign that was going on at that time called Coney 2012, and how young people all over the world were trying to get involved to draw attention to these offenses against young people in Central Africa. Then it hit home when I asked the question, why should all of you and supposedly 100 million other young people get involved in this? And one of the students responded with a question. What if it was us? You know, it could be us or it could be other kids like us. So then I asked them the question, what's next? And they just told me, Bishop Mark, go watch the video. And they challenged me to get involved because it was one of those things online where you could uh, interact with the website and so forth. They wanted me to get involved in this campaign against this man, Joseph Coney, and his militia. And they said, you need to do this so that young people can be safe. Now after that session, I celebrated mass with those high school students. And when it came time for the general intercessions during the liturgy, someone read prayers of intercession that were written by one of the teachers from one of those schools. But when those intercessions were finished, you know, they were the typical ones you would expect you have to have um, for, for Mass. And I said to the group, do you have any other intentions that you want to pray for right now? And one by one, they started to pray for young people in Central Africa. And they prayed for young people at home, even in their own families. They prayed for peace, prayed for justice, they prayed for mercy and forgiveness so that they could prevail in our world instead of violence. I can't begin to explain to you how extremely powerful 
and meaningful that prayer became at that time. Now getting back to my lecture on Catholic social teaching at St. Francis University, I asked the man who wanted to know, how do you teach young people about Catholic social teaching? I asked, does this answer your question? And his response was, I would have never thought about it that way. I would have never thought about it that way. And the way that he's talking about is simply the impact that paying attention to world events and circumstances of people's lives can have on our learning and witnessing the social teaching of the church. You know, it's understood even in the field of catechetics that the way of learning based on deductive understanding of things that begins with objective principles has been more or less repl been replaced in our time by an inductive method of reasoning through which knowledge is derived from a serious reflection on personal experience. You know what that means? You understand that concept? There's a shift in, in, in the way things are learned and taught. Do you know who is an expert on that kind of concept? It was Blessed John Paul II. But I'm here to talk to you about Pope Francis, right? And our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has not wasted any time since his election in paying attention to all sorts of painful and sometimes overlooked experiences of people throughout the world. By doing so, Pope Francis has caused people everywhere, including Catholics and non-Catholics, to pay attention to those persons and to the questions and issues that pertain to their circumstances and their experiences. Pope Francis, you probably are aware, has been both praised and criticized for what he has done and what he has said in this regard. And a number of things for which he has been criticized are not even things that he even said. People who label themselves as conservative or liberal or traditional or modern in their view of the world and the church have all asked these questions. And the questions are, is Pope Francis trying to start a revolution? And they've asked the question, is Pope Francis himself a revolutionary? In an article that was published in the Wall Street Journal back in November of 2013, the Catholic author George Weigel asserts that Pope Francis is indeed a revolutionary. It was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal and that was the the title of the article. However, the revolution proposed by the Holy Father is not a matter of economic or political prescription. Instead, Weigel describes the revolution of Pope Francis as a revolution in the self-understanding of the Catholic Church. Weigel calls it a re-energizing return to the Pentecostal fervor and evangelical passion from which the church was born two millennia ago. And it is a summons to mission that accelerates the great historical transition from an institutional maintenance Catholicism to the church of the new evangelization. That article was published in the Wall Street Journal on November 28th, 2013. You know, after reading Weigel's opinion about Pope Francis and this revolution, I began to think once again about the significance of Catholic social teaching in this revolution and this self-understanding of the church that Weigel is talking about. And he's not alone in pointing out that Pope Francis has something to say about Catholic social teaching in the apostolic exhortation Evangelii Gaudium which was promulgated November 24th, the last day of the year of faith that was inaugurated by Pope Benedict. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of my time with you this evening is to share some observations about where I see Pope Francis is at, in regard to basic principles of Catholic social teaching. And I would like to suggest some elements that when they're taken all together, 
suggest a kind of spirituality of Catholic social teaching, without which the so-called Pope Francis revolution might not be a revolution in the self-understanding of the church. And finally, I'd like to share some thoughts on the idea of action, which is often associated with Catholic social teaching. In the vocabulary of George Weigel, this action would involve a return to the Pentecostal fervor and evangelical passion that was found in the early days of our church. And as Weigel suggests, the action that is encouraged by Pope Francis involves a summons to mission and a transition from institutional maintenance to the new evangelization as primary ecclesiological principles. So first, Pope Francis and the principles of Catholic social teaching. If you've paid attention to the pontificate of, of Francis um, from his election, even to the present time, most people have become aware that there have been some unforeseen consequences of the way in which Pope Francis often begins speaking to the news media, and he does that without a prepared text and without a verbatim transcript of his exact words. As a result, Pope Francis has often been misquoted or misrepresented. There's also a difficulty with translation because even though Pope Francis can speak a little bit of English, things that are translated into the English language for our reading are not necessarily good translations to begin with. In some cases, his observations have been construed in a way that they are reported as matters which he never even mentioned. However, there are a couple of sources that reliably present the position of Pope Francis in regard to the uh, basic principles of Catholic social teaching. The first reliable source is the apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. And the other source comes as a surprise because I just told you about the difficulty with his interviews with the media and the problems that that has presented. But there's an interview that Pope Francis gave with the Italian journalist Andrea Tornelli in December, on December 10th, 2013. And the title of the uh, English translation of that interview, which is, I found it in a magazine called Inside the Vatican, published in January of this year. The title of the article is called Never Be Afraid of Tenderness. And I'll start with that interview because what the Holy Father says in that interview is so plain and clear. Tarnelli asked Pope Francis a question about the Holy Father's statement in the Apostolic Exhortation in which he, said, he talks about an economy that kills, an economy that kills. Those are the Pope's words in the Apostolic Exhortation. Now you may have read or heard in the news media that the Holy Father's comments about economic systems including capitalism have resulted in very strong criticism. Some have gone so far as to call Pope Francis a Marxist. For example, just three days after it was promulgated, the apostolic exhortation, the syndicated radio personality Rush Limbaugh referred to Evangelii Gaudium as pure Marxism. And he is quoted as saying, if it weren't for capitalism, I don't know where the Catholic Church would be. Well, good for Rush Limbaugh, I don't know either. But in response to Tornelli's question, Pope Francis reveals an important element of his position on Catholic social teaching. And this is what Pope Francis said, and it's a quote. There is nothing in the exhortation that cannot be found in the social doctrine of the church. I wasn't speaking from a technical point of view. What I was trying to do was to give a picture of what is going on. You follow that statement from the Pope? There's nothing in the exhortation that cannot be found in the social doctrine of the church. He was trying to give a picture of what's going on in the world today. In case you are wondering where you can find a clear reference to support the Holy Father's statement, 
that what he says in the exhortation about economic issues is found in Catholic social teaching. How about another quote from the UCAT? Question number 438 of the UCAT asks, why does the church have her own social teaching? And the response is this. It says, because all men, as children of God, possess a unique dignity. The church, with her social teaching, is committed to defending and promoting this human dignity for all men in the social sphere. She is not trying to preempt the legitimate freedom of politics or of the economy. When human dignity is violated in politics or economic practices, however, the church must intervene. Now, as usual, the UCAT response, that quote, is followed by references to the corresponding paragraph numbers in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So there's some reliable references for you to look at. It is taking people some time to get used to his, to get used to his approach, but what Pope Francis is saying is that in order for him to exercise his teaching office in today's world, he is going to continue to give a picture of what is going on in the lives of real people. And what captures people's attention is that the Pope draws us into those experiences, the experiences of others. And he does that in order for you and me to discover the truth. However, the Holy Father has not limited his teaching method to an inductive method that relies totally on experience. For the record, Pope Francis has explicitly stated that there is nothing in Evangelii Gaudium that cannot be found or understood according to the principles of Catholic social teaching. So what are these essential pr principles of Catholic social teaching that our Holy Father acknowledges and affirms? It's good for us to review them very briefly because they are important points of reference for the last two topics that I want to cover. How P Pope Francis is guiding us in regard to the relationship between Catholic social teaching and spirituality and Catholic social teaching and action. If you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church or the Compendium of Social Doctrine of the Church that was issued in 2004, you will find that there are basic, these are the basic principles of Catholic social teaching. They're sometimes organized slightly different, but here's, here's basically what they are. Number one, first principle. I love to share this with young people especially. All human life is sacred. All human life is sacred. The basic equality of all people flows from their dignity as human persons and the rights that flow from that dignity. Number two, the human person is the principle, the object, and the subject of every social group. The human person is front and center. Number three, the human person has been created by God to belong to and participate in a family and other social communities. Number four, respect for the rights of people flows from their dignity as persons. Social in all social, social society and all social organizations must promote virtue and protect human life and human rights and guarantee the conditions that promote the exercise of freedom. Number five, political communities and public authority are based on human nature. They belong to an order that is established by God. Number six, all human authority must be used for the common good of society. Number seven, the common good of society consists of respect for and promotion of the fundamental rights of the human person, the just development of material and spiritual goods of society, and the peace and safety of all people. Number eight, we need to work to eliminate the sinful inequalities that exist between peoples and for the improvement of the living conditions of people. 
the needs of the poor and vulnerable have a priority. And number nine, we are one human and global family. We are to share our spiritual blessings even more than our material blessings. Now these principles are not treated in a systematic or comprehensive way in the apostolic exhortation, the joy of the gospel. In fact, Pope Francis explicitly recommends the compendium, compendium of social doctrine of the church that I already mentioned. However, in chapter two of the apostolic exhortation, Pope Francis emphasizes some of these principles when he urges us to say no, to say no to a number of circumstances that are contrary to the dignity of persons and the common good. And in beginning with number 53 of the exhortation through number 60, Pope Francis says, we are to say no to an economy of exclusion. We are to say no to the new idolatry of money. We are to say no to a financial system which rules rather than serves. We are to say no to the inequality which spawns violence. And later in chapter four of the exhortation, Pope Francis explicitly mentions the following issues which are treated among the basic principles of Catholic social teaching. Beginning with number 186 and all the way up through numbers 258, I guess, Pope Francis says, we should consider the inclusion of the poor in society, the special place of the poor in, among God's people, the economy and the distribution of income, concern for the vulnerable, the common good and peace in society, realities that are more important than ideas. The whole is greater than the part. Social dialogue is a contribution to peace and social dialogue in the context of religious freedom. Those are all topics that the Holy Father touches upon in that chapter of the exhortation. They're all about Catholic social teaching. We all know that Pope Francis announced that the encyclical letter Lumen Fide that was promulgated on June 29th of last year is the work of four hands. Four hands. <laughs> Since it was largely the work of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, but it was promulgated by Pope Francis after he made some changes. As further indication of the constancy and the continuity of Catholic social teaching, Pope Francis states in Lumen Fidei that there is always a unity of faith, always a unity of faith. He says, since faith is one, it must be professed in all its purity and integrity. Precisely because all the articles of faith are interconnected, to deny one of them is tantamount to distorting the whole. And that's in Article 48 of Lumen Fidei. Immediately after addressing the principle of unity and faith in the encyclical, Pope Francis then addresses several principles of Catholic social teaching and how they are related to the virtue of faith and the unity and integrity of the Catholic faith. He mentions, for example, faith makes us appreciate the architecture of human relationships because it grasps their ultimate foundation and definitive destiny in God and in his love. As such, faith is a service to the common good. He says, faith informs the true nature of marriage, the family, and the gift of children, and through the family, Faith becomes a light capable of enlightening all relationships in society. He says, through faith we have come to understand the unique dignity of each person. Faith teaches us to see that every man and woman is a blessing because through them the light of God, of God's face shines on each one of us. He says, faith enables us to respect nature, which is a gift to us from our creator. 
Faith helps us to devise models of development that are based not simply on utility or profit, because faith teaches us that we are all indebted to God for the gift of creation. Pope Francis says in the encyclical, faith teaches us to establish just forms of government because all authority is meant for service of the common good. He says, faith teaches us that unity is superior to conflict. Faith helps us to be conscious of the suffering people of this world. And he says, faith assists us in avoiding the illusory enticements of the idols of this world. And if you're looking for the articles, they begin with Article 51 through 57 of that part of the encyclical. After reviewing the explicit references to principles of Catholic social teaching in the apostolic exhortation and the encyclical, I thought of the same question I had for the high school students when we were talking about Joseph Kony and the plight of young people in Central Africa. I started thinking, so where are we going with this? Well, it goes to the next part of my presentation, and that is Pope Francis and Catholic social teaching and spirituality. Now, I'm sure that you're aware that Pope Francis made the cover of Time Magazine as Person of the Year um, for 2013, and just a few weeks ago, I happened to be going through an airport and found his, cover, his picture on the cover of Rolling Stone. It's got all kinds of people talking. You know, there he is, the rock star, and that's what he's um, referred to in that article. Pope Francis is certainly aware that he is on the world stage as the leader of the Catholic Church. But there is no indication that our Holy Father sees himself as a celebrity. You know, when Pope Francis was introduced to the world on March 13th, 2013, I don't know about you, but I was watching. The first thing he did was to ask everyone to pray for him. He immediately bowed before the people gathered at St. Peter's Square. And they said in an instant, you could hear a pin drop. And if you've ever been in St. Peter's Square with that large of a crowd, it was extraordinary. As he began to speak about himself in the days and weeks following his election, Pope Francis has described himself as a son of the church who believes and teaches what the Catholic Church believes and teaches, and who wants others to hear and to be moved to conversion by the Catholic truth. Now, George Weigel reports that Pope Francis has also described himself as a sinner and a radically converted Christian disciple who has known the mercy of God in his own life and who wants to enable others to share that experience and the healing and the joy that comes from friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the term spirituality signifies a kind of itinerary for growth in our friendship with Jesus. This itinerary has as its final destination what we call holiness, an individual's firm, deep, integral, and dynamic communion with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This essential dimension of spirituality is found in the opening words of the apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, where Pope Francis writes, the joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Christ. It has been observed that these opening words are the key to understanding this exhortation. And this is the very same key that unlocks the meaning of our lives. This key is a response to an invitation to encounter Jesus Christ. And as Pope Francis himself writes in number three, of the exhortation, and this is a quote. I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. 
No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. That's a quote from Pope Francis. Now George Weigel in that Wall Street Journal article reminds us that Pope Francis is a pastor who is deeply concerned for the flock, who draws spiritual strength from the flock and challenges the flock to make good decisions and he respects popular piety. Weigel's insight concerning popular piety is an important element of spirituality that's worth noting because this theme is noted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which quotes, by the way, in a very long quotation, paragraph 448 of the final document of the Third General Conference of Bishops of Latin America held in Pueblo, Mexico in 1979. Now why do I think that's significant? I think it's significant because there's the Catechism quoting a document from Latin America. And where is Pope Francis from? Buenos Aires, Argentina. And so the mentality, the mindset, the worldview that's contained in that document would be part of the kind of DNA of Pope Francis in his, his view of things as well. This quote from the final document of the Salem Conference highlights the connection between Catholic spirituality in the form of popular piety of the laity and elements of Catholic social teaching. It does so explicitly, and I'll read it for, to you for in a moment, or parts of it. First it states, at its core, the piety of the people is a storehouse of values that offers answers of Christian wisdom to the great questions of life. The Catholic wisdom of the people is capable of fashioning a vital synthesis. The reference to values and answers of Christian wisdom suggests that piety as a form of spirituality has as its core certain principles that can be synthesized in support of each one of us living our faith. Next, that Salem document that's quoted in the Catechism, it states, piety creatively combines the divine and the human, Christ and Mary, spirit and body, communion and institution, person and community, faith and homeland, intelligence and emotion. This reference to various combinations of divine and human, communion and institution, intelligence and, and emotion, it suggests an understanding of the approach to social issues of social teaching that has been modeled for the whole world to see by the person of Pope Francis. People repeatedly say that they are inspired by the Holy Father's spirituality, which is expressed in his tender care for the poor, the sick, and those who are in prison. Trust me, I was there in Castle Gandolfo last summer. I was there with people who were suffering and I saw their interaction with the Pope. It's also interesting to note the mention of the combination of Christ and Mary in that document from Salem, because at the heart of Pope Francis's approach to understanding and applying the church's social teaching is the need for everyone to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And it is unmistakable that the personal spirituality of Pope Francis includes a very strong and vibrant devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. In an interview in September of 2013 with Father Antonio Spadaro, a Jesuit priest who is editor of uh, the Jesuit Italian journal, Pope Francis spoke of his devotion to Mary and his frequent visits to the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. And in Evangelii Gaudium, the exhortation Pope Francis devotes one section of the exhortation to the Blessed Virgin Mary, where he indicates her special role in the work of evangelization, in which principles of Catholic social teaching are communicated to those in need, not 
in an abstract way, but in a way that is felt in their hearts because Mary, Mary understands human suffering because her heart was pierced with a sword. Pope Francis talks about or describes Mary as a mother, a sign of hope for people suffering the birth pangs of justice. He says, as a mother, Mary walks at our side, shares our struggles, and constantly surrounds us with God's love. And Pope Francis also says in the exhortation that whenever we look to Mary, we come to believe once again in the revolutionary nature of love and tenderness. He says that in the person of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we see that humility and tenderness are not virtues of the weak, but of the strong, who need not treat others poorly in order to feel important about themselves. Pope Francis says so much more about the Blessed Virgin Mary in this regard, but I think you get the point that he is sincere in recognizing her role in regard to the spirituality that must be associated with learning and announcing the Church's social teaching. Now returning to that quote from the Salem document that's in the Catechism, it states that the wisdom that comes from the spirituality that is the piety of the people, there is a Christian humanism that radically affirms the dignity of every person as a child of God, that establishes a basic fraternity, that teaches people to encounter nature and understand work that provides reasons for joy and humor even in the midst of a very hard life, that is a principle of discernment and an evangelical instinct through which the people spontaneously sense when the gospel is served in the church and when it is emptied of its content and stifled by other interests. I dare anyone to take that quote from that Salem document as it's found in the Catechism and compare word for word what Pope Francis says in the Apostolic Exhortation. And I'll think, I think immediately you'll recognize where he's coming from. Obviously, there are principles of Catholic social teaching that are affected in personal human ways through spirituality. They include the affirmation of the God-given human dignity of persons the fraternal relationships that ought to exist among people, the encounter that we have with nature, and the true meaning of work. But the Salem document cited in the Catechism suggests that teaching and the actions of Pope Francis are not entirely revolutionary. One of his favorite themes, if you've heard him talk about it, is joy and good humor. He's often critical of people who walk around as he, one of his favorite sayings is, with a sourpuss. It's not a coincidence that the title of the first, his first apostolic exhortation is the joy of the gospel. And in that exhortation, Pope Francis warns against a presentation of the gospel that's empty of its content, materially and spiritually. And he warns against those experiences where the gospel is stifled by other interests. Much more can be said about the relationship between the Holy Father's approach to Catholic social teaching and the spirituality that is necessary to ensure the integrity of that teaching and its application in the concrete circumstances of people's lives. If you ever want to do a meditation for yourself, I met a family whose daughter suffers from a number of um, neurological illnesses when I was with the Pope last summer. And to gaze at the mother and the fa father of that child was for me a spiritual reflection because when you saw the Pope interacting with those persons, you know he was not a rock star. He was not some caricature. He was a living and loving example of what the gospel is, as he says in the exhortation. So I hope that these observations are helpful for you to see the connection and understand 
the depth of conversion to which the church is being called by Pope Francis, as he urges every one of us to re-examine our encounter with the person of Christ and his gospel, because every single one of us is being summoned by the Holy Father to carry out a very important work of our vocation as disciples. And that leads me to my last section, which is a little bit shorter than the others. And it's Pope Francis and Catholic social teaching and action. I regret that I did not write down this reference. Sometimes I'm multitasking and I forget where I was when I found something, but I think this quote comes from, this expression comes from one of his weekday homilies. And I'm fortunate to have an authentic translation in English in my possession when I wake up in the morning, which is a little bit after Pope Francis has already celebrated daily mass. But I came across something that he said that includes Catholic social teaching, spirituality, and action all together. He said, it's not enough for us to pray for the poor. We must pray with the poor because we are also poor. It's not enough to just pray for the poor. We must pray with the poor because we are also poor. And that saying of Pope Francis reminds me of that encounter I had with the high school students who told me about someone I had never heard of before by the name of Joseph Coney. In that lively discussion, those young people were passionate in identifying without using the same vocabulary a variety of principles of Catholic social teaching that were at stake in the plight of children and youth in Central Africa. And when it came time to celebrate Mass, they were certainly moved to pray for those children and youth in Africa and elsewhere, those who are poor and suffering. And even though they could not be physically present to those children, that group of high school students took action and got involved in a worldwide campaign to put spot, the spotlight and the, on the lack of justice in the person of this Joseph Coney. They wanted to put the spotlight, rather, on mercy and compassion. The means of being in solidarity with children and youth of Central Africa for those high school students was something that you're more familiar with, the students here, than I am. You call it social media. They used for that campaign in 2012 YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and text messages to further that cause. Now, I would venture to guess that the majority of people in this room have in their possession something like this, a device that can put you in contact with hundreds of people in a minute or less. I've seen it happen. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I will admit, what came with this phone has only been added to by my calendar, my directory of phone numbers, including my mother's, who, which is at the top of the list, and one app one app, which is the app that gets me to the Liturgy of the Hours so I can pray even if I forget my book. But in one minute or less, you could be in contact with literally hundreds of people. Isn't that technologically possible by pushing a button? I wouldn't be surprised that some of you may be sending a message to a friend even this evening that you are at this lecture. And people ask me, Bishop, after this is over, can I get a picture with you? And before I can get home, there's already messages coming to me from people who saw me who were not at my lecture. Just last month, on January 24th, Pope Francis issued a message to draw attention to the 48th annual World Communications Day, which will be observed on June 1st of this year. And this year's theme of that day is communication at the service of an authentic culture of encounter. Wow, where have you heard those words tonight? Now, isn't it interesting because for Pope Francis, the importance of Catholic social teaching that sh is shared and lived is realized in and through this encounter with the Lord Jesus and in and through an encounter with those who are poor 
who are suffering, who are persecuted or neglected, so that they might have an encounter with Christ through us. So Pope Francis says in his message for World Communications Day that every one of us is called to work toward creating and sustaining an authentic culture of encounter. He encourages the use of technology to foster communication, but the Holy Father also warns against the distance and the disconnect that can result from the pseudo-encounter that is experienced through social media and digital technology. So I would encourage you, like my high school friends, to go ahead and use your electro electronic devices and get the word out. Because all of you, all of you here are needed by our Pope to be agents of the new evangelization. But don't forget that what has caught everyone's attention and it is described as what gives people the impression that Pope Francis is truly authentic. It's when he is seen celebrating Mass in a prison for young people and washing their feet on Holy Thursday instead of in St. Peter's Basilica. And one of the women whose feet he washed last Holy Thursday happens to be Muslim. Or when he's seen making his first trip outside of Rome after he became Pope to the village of Lampedusa where the people regularly have to care from that village for the few survivors, or at least to bury the dead bodies that wash ashore, the poor people who are refugees from other places all around the Mediterranean, who come on overcrowded boats looking for freedom and a new life. Or the times that people recognize Pope Francis as being authentic, as he holds in his hand and touches the face of a man whose face is covered with hundreds of tumors, or the scene of Pope Francis sitting at a confessional station at, at World Youth Day, where young men and women could come and find God's mercy through that sacrament. And the list goes on. There are people all around us, whether it's here at Steubenville, or back home, or in Central Africa, where the basic dignity of human persons is not respected and it's not safeguarded. All over the world, there are places where children die of hunger every day, where parents cannot care for their children because they have no income, where young people are bullied or shunned or ignored by their peers. And that list goes on too. It reminds me once again of my encounter with those high school students who gave me a refresher course that day on Catholic social te teaching by referring to a YouTube video and a person named Coney. And it reminds me once again of the question that I asked them, so what comes next? I think that's the good place to end this presentation because Pope Francis is, as George Weigel says, a revolutionary. He is calling everyone in the church to a revolutionary experience through which he is urging us to become a church that is passionate, passionate about its mission to go out to those who have not encountered Jesus Christ, but have only been beaten down by the circumstances of life. George Weigel describes the revolution of Francis as a revolution in the self-understanding of the Catholic Church. He calls it a re-energizing return to Pentecostal fervor and evangelical, evangelical passion from which the Church was born two millennia ago. And it is a summons to mission that accelerates the great historical transition from an institutional maintenance Catholicism to the church of the new evangelization. All of that might sound to you like hard work, but for me, I think it's exciting. And I say that for a couple of personal reasons, especially because for 20 years of the 30 years that I was a priest before I became a bishop, I was stuck behind a desk five and a half days a week doing the same work day in and day out. And I sometimes wondered what it would be like to go out there instead of work, do my work for the church behind a desk. 
You know, people often ask me, how's it going, and how do I see things down the road? I'm the first to admit that what I do as a bishop and as a disciple of Christ is hard work. But you know, when I meet young people like those high school students who are teaching me about Catholic social teaching, about spirituality and about action and even about the principles on which our faith stands. And when I meet young people such as you, the students here at Franciscan University, my response to people when they ask me, how's it going, I tell them, it's awesome. And it's awesome especially because you continue to remind me of the answers for two of the most important questions in my life and the life of every other person. Who made me and why did God make me? Thank you.